So in the first part of this lecture, we had a look at the history of electricity and electronics, and basically, I suppose, a look at the past and where things have come from. And for the second half, I'd like to look a little bit at maybe where things are going, um, specifically in terms of increased demands on power and information, I suppose, um, in relation to the amount of electrical systems and electronic devices that we have now, um, so some innovation is, is, is required. It's also nice to have a look at um, some predictions of, of the future. And um, I have two interesting ones here. One is from Mark Twain. The picture shown here on the, on the screen is of Mark Twain in Nikola Tesla's laboratory. We saw Nikola Tesla earlier on. Twain and um, Tesla were good friends and they, um, tes uh, Tesla helped um, spark Twain's interest in science and technology. The um, text shown here on the screen is from a short story that Twain wrote in 1898. It was called from the London Times of 1904. And it imagined a future where a person with a device called a telectroscope was able to communicate with people all around the world. And indeed, strangely uh, prescient of, of things we can do today. And he talks about how the person was able to, as you can see here, call up one corner of the globe after another, look upon its life and study its strange sights and speak with its people. And indeed, the person was able to, I suppose, effectively tune in to people in places from Hong Kong to Melbourne. And as it says here, uh, he was wandering around the remote underworld where the sun was shining in the sky and the people were at their daily work, um, despite the fact that it was nighttime in the place that um, the person with his telescope was. Similarly, some uh, very interesting predictions of the future by Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke is famously known well, uh, primarily as a science fiction writer, but also having predicted various technologies such as um, satellite communication. And um, there's an interesting TV show you can uh, view on YouTube, which is from the BBC uh, channel, and it's from a TV show called Horizon, recorded in 1964. And basically, um, Arthur C. Clarke talks about uh, how in the future we will be able to contact our friends everywhere on the Earth, even if we don't know their actual physical location. So in 1964, this seemed quite fantastical, I suppose, to um, a world where um, there was landline telephones, but certainly no means of communicating anybody, no matter where they were. He also talked about how we could use this communication system for not just um, personal reasons, but also for business. And indeed, a person would be able to um, reduce the, the need to travel for business through such a communication mechanism. And um, even uh, go so far as to predict the idea of um, surgery um, over the system. So as he says here, we may have brain surgeons in Edinburgh operating on patients in New, New Zealand. And uh, indeed, some of that is coming to pass today. He says that when that time comes, the whole world would have shrunk to a point and the traditional role of a city as a meeting place for a man would have ceased to make any sense. So you'll be aware, I suppose, that there's been a huge boom in the amount of electrical and electronic systems that we are using, whether it be in our homes, our businesses, or in our uh, transport. And in terms of uh, power requirements, there's been a, a surge, I suppose, in the amount of power required to power all of these systems. So I suppose we have uh, an increase in various things. We've been increasing world population, but we also have a huge increase, um, disproportionate increase, I suppose, in terms of the power being used. This graphic here shows basically a growth from the 60s to near present. And you can see here in 1965, we have total power requirement of about 1 plus 2 plus 2, which is 5 terawatts. This is the average amount of power being used per year. And increasing over time, you can see up in 2005, we have uh, about 1 and 3 and 4 and 5, so somewhere around uh, 13, 14 terawatts of power. And indeed, at present, that's increased to 15 terawatts of power being used around the world. So trebling in the amount of power being used since 1965, um, to today. I suppose a large portion of this of course is being driven by um, emerging regions. The so-called BRIC countries, which is Brazil, Russia, India and China, are having a large contribution to this. Uh, this is a, a gross graph which shows, or a gross table which shows some of the figures, for example, from China. We can see the energy use has increased by 146, 146%. And in the uh, India, it's increased by 91%. In the Middle East, it's increased by 170%. And um, you can see the various growth figures there for the 
uh, regions around the world. So in parallel with this huge growth in the demand for electricity, we also have a huge growth in the, in the number of devices and computers and mobile systems that we are using now today. Um, the first stat here, this comes from the International Telecommunications Union, and it says that the total number of mobile phone subscriptions around the world has reached almost 6 billion. That's by the end of last year. So that's 86% of, of the world's population um, have um, potentially a, a, a mobile phone. Um, also, we can see a, a huge growth in the number of broadband connections for people. So there is nearly 1.6 billion uh, broadband connections split between mobile and fixed. And you can see here again, the mobile broadband is um, more prevalent than fixed line subscriptions, which are still increasing, but not as as um, quickly as, as mobile subscriptions. And in general, a third of the world's population have been online in uh, by 2011. So that's 2.3 billion people. So we can imagine that with this growth in power um, requirements around the world, and also with the growth in the number of devices we have, that power optimization and conserving energy becomes increasingly important as resources are um, increasingly being uh, used up. And uh, with all of these devices, I suppose the question is, how do we power them? So we know that devices that we are using are getting smaller and smaller. These also have um, increased requirements in terms of having smaller transformers to have, I suppose, more efficient power delivery mechanisms to um, conserve energy and also to power the larger range of devices that we now have. The growth in energy requirements and the growth in electricity is in conjunction with a, another growth, which is in terms of the amount of data or the amount of information that, that has been created and copied around the world. This is a study from IDC from a few years ago, which was called the Digital Universe Study. And basically it found that in 2010, there was um, 1.2 zettabytes of, of digital information being created in the world. That's, um, if you think of a gigabyte in terms of a measure of storage for, for example, a USB drive or maybe your phone having whatever, 8 or 16 gigabytes, 1.2 zettabytes corresponds to 1.2 trillion of those. And in terms of physical storage, you could imagine a stack of DVDs stretching all the way from the Earth to the moon and back again. The, there's actually a surprising growth in terms of the data that is, is being created. And indeed, by 2020, the prediction is that there will be 35 zettabytes of data. That's 35 trillion gigabytes. And indeed, again, in terms of physical storage, you can imagine a stack of DVDs reaching halfway to Mars. A very important law in electronics is Moore's Law. Moore's Law is named after uh, Gordon Moore, who was an engineer at Intel, and he uh, made a prediction that the number of transistors, and as you will know, transistors are basically the building block of, of microprocessors, which are our computing cores, um, the number of transistors would double every two years. And there's a graph shown here which is showing basically how Moore's Law has more or less held to this prediction of transistor counts doubling every two years on commercial, uh, commercially available uh, microprocessors. You can see here, 1971, this is, um, we saw in the last part, the time when the Intel 4004 was introduced, and then growing up here to uh, present where we have our i5, i6, and i7 core uh, microprocessors, uh, the law has basically held true. This is a picture of one of the latest um, Intel microprocessors, codenamed Ivy Bridge. It's a four-core uh, microprocessor. Um, there's actually 1.4 billion transistors on this um, this tiny device. So we saw in the first part, we saw some of the early um, transistors built by Shockley Al from um, from Bell Labs, and um, quite sizable um, devices they were. But if you can imagine, um, these have been shrunk down significantly. Um, over the past few years, and um, with this um, tiny little device contains 1.4 billion of those transistors on our typical microprocessor chip. So it may look big here in this picture, but in reality, this is the size. So the Ivy Bridge uh, microprocessor is 8 millimeters by 19 millimeters, and that's actually the same um, height as the radius of a Eurocent. So we could actually stack two of these Ivy Bridge microprocessors on top of each other and still just be the width of one Eurocent.
This um, increase in the number of transistors that we can fit onto a microprocessor and indeed the speeds that these microprocessors can then operate at led me to wonder recently, could we actually create a computer that would process as fast as a human brain? There's been a variety of estimates for how fast the brain works and um, the, I suppose, range typically goes from 10 to the power of 16 flops. A flop is basically a typical operation that a computer could, could run. Um, it's called floating operations per second, floating point operations per second, up to 10 to the power of 19 flops. At the moment, our um, supercomputers can operate in or around 2.5 by 10 to the power of 15 floating operations per second. So if we use um, Moore's law and if we kind of extrapolate where in the future maybe computers would be, and we go from that 2 to the power 2.5 by um, 10 to the 15 flops, we can imagine that by 2025, and we extrapolate that curve, that we could somewhere be somewhere at 10 to the power of 19 flops. And that, I suppose, roughly is equivalent to the estimates of the um, speed at which a brain can process. And indeed, if we go another 15 years beyond that, we can imagine this would grow further to about 5 by 10 to the power of 22 flops, which in theory will be equivalent to the complete uh, processing power of about 5,000 people. In parallel with Moore's Law, there is another um, uh, increase, I suppose, in terms of storage and in terms of data storage. And this is a tribute to a person called Crider, who worked with the um, hard drive company Seagate. And indeed, it shows another growth in terms of the amount of storage capacity available um, in terms of time. And you can see, again, um, this holding to a curve. The capacity over the past 15 years, um, according to Crider's law, and that graph we've just seen has increased by about a factor of a thousand. And indeed, the kind of memory storage drives we have at the moment are roughly, you would say, about two to three terabytes for commercially available. Um, uh, the biggest, I suppose, commercially available storage drive you can currently get. In parallel, I suppose, the um, estimates for the storage of a human brain, and this is from a Scientific American short piece by a guy called Paul Reber, is that the brain can hold about 2,500 terabytes. Now, if we assume that the storage capacity has increased by a factor of a thousand over the past 15 years, and that a typical commercial drive can hold about two to three terabytes, then it's not unreasonable to, I suppose, assume that um, if there's another increase of, of a thousand in the next um, 15 or so years, that a commercially available drive in 15 years' time could be able to store the same information as a brain could hold. So, there are, of course, estimates that vary the amount of storage that, um, of a brain upwards or downwards by um, a factor of a thousand, but um, nonetheless, that still will be realizable within, within another 15 years. Of course, the brain is a lot more than just storage and processing. If that was the case, we could probably create a brain right now by, um, by connecting together many um, high-speed computers and many large storage devices. But the brain, of course, involves many other interactions between the neurons in the brain. And there's that magic ingredient, which is consciousness, something we may not be able to create as easily. There is a, an interesting book, which is um, called The Brain is Wider Than the Sky by Brian Appleyard. And indeed, this talks about the complexities involved in, in, in recreating a brain. That hasn't stopped other people, like, for example, the great um, Ray Kurzweil, who um, is a very famous inventor and also the founder of Singularity University and uh, well known for the term, the singularity, where basically um, in the future he predicts that we will be able to upload our brain to some sort of computer network by 2040. And um, this could indeed capture a person's entire personality, memory, skills, and history. In the reverse direction, in fact, in that, video I mentioned earlier on by R.C. Clark, he talked about uploading to our brains where at night we could actually learn new skills, new languages, um, just by plugging in our brains and having information uploaded to them. So indeed, if you can imagine it, the sky is certainly the limit, and I hope we'll be looking at some interesting ideas over the next few lectures. Thanks.